well, we're happy to, to uh, welcome you to our seminar. And it is basically uh, just a normal seminar. I will tell you in a minute. Perhaps you allow me to introduce myself very briefly and this seminar. Uh, well, I, I have been uh, a student in Bonn and did 40 years ago my, my master's uh, under Professor Karl Dietrich Bracher at the Philosophische Fakultät. And uh, two years later, my PhD also with Professor Bracher. And uh, well, after a few years as a politician, uh, member of the Bundestag, I uh, uh, was uh, asked by King's College London in 2009 to become a visiting professor. And uh, at King's, we established the Center for Climate, Energy and Resource Security, the European Center for Climate, Energy and Resource Security, USERS. And uh, well, USERS introduced um, climate and energy issues to geopolitics because they have repercussions on security issues. And that was the reason why uh, J.D. Bindenagel, who is with us today, Ulrich Schlie, uh, Dekan Kronenberg and others asked me whether I uh, cannot uh, bring the center and what we do in research to Bonn. And I happily agreed because it is my old alma mater, of course. And since uh, the summer, I, I teach in, in Bonn. And we started uh, last uh, summer with a seminar for master students on the geopolitics of climate change. So the interesting topic here is how does climate change uh, influence uh, geopolitical stability? Uh, how will it exacerbate uh, existing conflicts, potential conflicts? And uh, this seminar, this semester, we continued uh, with the geopolitics of water. And uh, well, we see all over the world, especially of course in, in uh, Southeast Asia, between China and uh, India, between India and Pakistan, in Central Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, wherever we look, we see that water issues have enormous uh, repercussions for the uh, regional and also for global security. And that is exactly the topic of our seminar. So the, the students that, that we have in our seminar, they do their papers on uh, issues like dam conflicts, a case study of the Mekong River Basin, or water conflicts, uh, a case study India, China. Ethiopia's mega dam and security implications for Egypt, climate induced droughts and conflicts in sub Saharan Africa. By the way, they have also, uh, they are the impulse for many people to migrate. And migration uh, movements have a lot to do with climate and water issues, and also that we are uh, dealing with in the seminar. So, that is what, what we do here. And basically, originally, this seminar uh, today was just for a few students. Uh, but then we, we got wonderful speakers. Uh, Brahma Chelani from India, whom I will introduce later, Jürgen Trittin, whom you all know, and of course, Ursula uh, Heinen Esser, uh, the Minister of the State of North Rhine-Westphalia for Environment. And she is in particular welcome because it is the state of North Rhine-Westphalia which, well, uh, supported strongly uh, the, uh, the foundation of CASAS and is with us. So that is a little bit the background uh, for, uh, today's, uh, for today's meeting. Uh, well, I don't know if... Uh, uh, if uh, uh, the rector of our university uh, has already arrived. I see uh, Jürgen Trittin nodding. And of course, because we have this great speakers uh, with us today, we asked uh, Professor Dr. Michael Hoch, uh, who has been rector in uh, Bonn uh, since 2015,
to join us and uh, give a word of greeting. Um, Professor Hoch uh, has studied and uh, taught, worked as an academician in, in uh, Munich, in Göttingen, in Heidelberg, uh, well, and then also uh, abroad in Paris. So he has a very distinguished academic career and uh, we're proud to have him since uh, 1999 in Bonn and uh, well, since uh, five years now, almost six years uh, in his function as rector. And uh, it's an honor that uh, you, you uh, are here with us today and uh, I give you the floor, uh, Magnificence, please. Er ist nicht da. So I just saw Jürgen Trittin nodding when I asked. So I, I thought he's not, 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 not only because... to Ursula Heinen Esser because she remarks she's also responsible for agriculture and forest. Okay, that, that I would uh, Thank do you very when, much. I, when I introduce her, I will do that uh, in, in exactly that manner. Well, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I did not see that, that uh, Professor Hoch is not uh, with us. He will probably join. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the great chance to have uh, Ursula uh, Heinen Esser with us. She, is, uh, she has been a member of parliament for many, many years. Uh, she was a state secretary for, well, seven or eight years and uh, is, uh, was state secretary for environment, for agriculture, for food, uh, for Verbraucherschutz. So she has a broad range of issues. And uh, Armin Laschet then, when he became prime minister of Northern Westphalia, uh, well, he did a smart move in, in getting her into his team. Yeah. And uh, since then, he is a, she is a minister and uh, Jürgen Trittin has raised that you're also uh, well responsible for forests, and environment. Well, we are happy to have you, uh, Ulla, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, my friend uh, Friedbert. Uh, hello, my former colleague, Jürgen Trittin. Um, dear sir or madam, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be able to give a short welcome at your conference today. You know, water and um, climate change are very important issues for me um, in my ministry. And uh, as you said before, I'm Minister for um, uh, Environment, Agriculture, Forest, Consumer Protection, and um, these are a lot of issues. And, but the common uh, link between all this is um, the climate change. And so I will give you a short a brief introduction about uh, water management, climate change, climate adaptation in Northern Westphalia. Uh, climate change and its effects have long since arrived in Northern Westphalia and are bringing really visible changes. Um, Northern Westphalia has always been a water rich state, but the past three extremely dry summers and the dry months of this year have shown how dependent we are on weather and climate. Um, we um, have a lot of problems nowadays in um, forest and in agriculture because of that. Current climate forecasts do not expect North Amazonia's annual precipitation to decrease significantly. However, rain will probably shift more strongly into the winter half year, and the probability of dry periods in spring and summer is growing. The prolonged dry period in North Amazonia can be seen from falling groundwater levels. New groundwater can hardly form because of the rainfall deficit we have and because of the high temperatures we have in summer. At the same time, more groundwater is extracted. That's the next problem. For example, for the irrigation of agricultural land, applications for the extraction of water for irrigation are therefore already being particularly rejected or restricted in dry periods. Therefore, we have a lot of discussions with farmers, um, even in North Hemisphere. In my area of responsibility, agriculture, 
forestry, water management are particularly affected. Water management must adapt to climate change in all areas. For example, floods and dry periods, falling groundwater levels, heavy rainfall events and their consequences, and climate-related changes in water and drinking water quality. And this is a task not only in my state, in Northern Westphalia, it is also a task in Germany, the EU, and we can say it's a task worldwide. Forward-looking action and sustainable management of water resources are necessary to achieve the goal of climate resilience water use. We are therefore developing a concept for long-term dry periods in my state. In 2021, the focus will be on groundwater and groundwater management. But this internal concept will not have much success unless we are supported by similar initiatives at federal and EU level. As is well known, nobody can master climate change alone. We are all interdependent. This is why we can and must support each other, exchange knowledge, use synergies, and so on. That is why conferences like this is one today are an important building block for mastering the challenges ahead. And now I see the magnificence. Hello, Professor Ho. Very good to see you here. And thank you very much for supporting the CASIS Research Center, because as you know, the state government is very interested in um, this institute. And so thank you very much for uh, your support, as I say. <laughs> so water has sometimes led a shadowy existence in climate adaptation strategies. Water always only becomes noticeable when there's too much or too little. And this despite the fact that sustainable and climate resilient water management is a critical building block for the overall climate resilience of economic sectors, ecosystems, and society at large. Climate change affects the water cycle, but the effects are diverse across different regions in Europe and manifest with seasonal variability. Of course, future is uncertain, as we all know. While there's a clear north-south gradient with southern regions of Europe much more impacted, through the effects of extreme heat mm -hmm. and broad, other parts of Europe will increasingly have to face seasonal water stress and drought as well, as we saw it the last three years, for example, in Germany, in the middle of Germany. Indirect climate change effects on water system can further result from adaptation measures in other sectors, but a cross-sectoral coordination is required to prevent trade-offs. This applies especially to the agricultural and energy industries where adaptation to changes in temperature and rainfall may result in higher water withdrawals for irrigation and cooling, but also urban development. A big problem, of course, as you all know, is the gray infrastructure, such as dams and dikes, built to increase water supply for irrigation or maintain water levels for shipping. They damage water-related ecosystems and the critical services they provide for resilient water systems. As a result, they should only be applied in exceptional cases when necessary for sustainable human development. It's very important for us in Northern Australia too. Perhaps as you know, we have the River Rhine and we have a lot of problems with the River Rhine, um, even in drought times, but in, uh, in the beginning, spring too, and there's a lot of water. Against this background, an explicit recognition for the fundamental importance of sustainable water management and healthy water resources must be included in the new edition of the EU Climate Adaptation Strategy. A, correspond a corresponding policy paper has just been discussed on, at the conference Climate Change and the European Water Dimension from our Federal Environment Ministry in early November 2020. The proposals in the policy paper are aimed, among other things, at first, better integration of water-related climate risks into other EU policies and strategies, 
Second, a highlighting of water-related issues in the new EU climate change adaptation strategy. And third, measures to promote sustainable water management as a key component of climate resilience in the EU. Concrete suggestions include an EU-wide uniform definition of climate change adaptation financing and a clearer distinction between financing of adaptation measures in the water sector at regional and municipal level. Furthermore, a uniform approach to climate risk assessment and better and more uniform data on climate risk in the water sector, the promotion of cross-border cooperation on adaptation to climate change. There is a lot to be done, and we are all co called upon to handle the valuable resource of water with care and to use it uh, very carefully. Health, economic development, and social security depend directly on the supply of water. I wish us a very success in this process. And I wish you today a very successful day and very interesting and good discussions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ola. Uh, we, we all do know that uh, the Parliament is in session uh, and uh, uh, you have to hurry. We'd be happy, of course, if you could stay for a while, but feel free to leave us at any time. Thanks a lot. And, and now I can... Uh, finally give the floor to uh, Professor Michael Ho. Uh, we are very happy, uh, Magnificent, that you uh, could make it and uh, that you give us the honor in this seminar. Uh, as I said before, this was uh, originally just a normal seminar for master students. Uh, they are here, of course, they, they, they listen, but uh, then we decided to open it up uh, after we got uh, an okay from Rama Celani, Jürgen Trattin, and Ursula Heinen Essa. And then we decided to ask you for a short word of greeting. Um, please, Magnificence, the floor is yours. You're, you're still muted. So now hopefully it's working. Can you hear me? <laughs> so dear Minister Heinen-Esser, um, dear Professor Pflüger, dear colleagues, distinguished guests. So first of all, thank you for being so patient. So as it happens often these days, um, there are connections, there were connection problems. So I had to fiddle around to get things going. And this is why you can see me here with my iPad um, in a little bit tilted way. Um, instead of uh, with a computer. So thank you for being so patient. So Professor Pflüger, uh, when, when you wrote me this letter by asking me whether I would be uh, willing to, to give this little welcome address, I was very pleased because on the one hand, this topic is a very interesting and timely topic. So me as a biologist, of course, I know uh, how important water in general is for, for life. Um, but also because I'm feeling that this is going to be a major topic in the next decade. So not only for the society uh, as a whole, but also for our university. So you may know that we have with Professor Evers an UNESCO chair that deals basically with this topic of hydrology so water uh, resource management. And there's even uh, several um, you know, collaborative research centers, at least one of them, where the topic of hydrology plays a very important role. And since the University of Bonn plays a very strong focus on the topic of sustainable futures, um, this, this is not only for Germany, a, a very timely issue for, for the, um, you know, the, the regions here, but also in, in, the, in the context of the Global South and, and other uh, countries that, that we are interested in. And so, so therefore, this is a, a very timely, a very good topic. And I was happy to hear um, that you're following this. And so I was happy to, to be part of, of the you know, people giving the welcome addresses. In general, maybe 
towards the CASIS, you know, which is another very important structure that has been developed due to the initiative, I think, to the Dean of the uh, uh, Faculty of Arts, Professor Cronenberg, very strongly. And I'm, I'm also very pleased to see that this is now basically shaping up more and more people are recruited to this structure. Also, Professor Schlie, for example, who came in here as a recent recruit. And um, so this is also, this is important, this CASI structure, because uh, this answers another aspect that the University of Bonn is interested in, namely to look also into Europe, to look in, not only into politics, um, war and peace, you know, these types of issues, but also to look, uh, to look at how other things like um, resources, for example, uh, are shared in the world, but, but also, um, let's, let's say, uh, uh, topics uh, which, which are following here, which has to do with the, with the management, for example, of water and other natural resources. Uh, environmental issues and so forth. So that is a very important and interesting structure that developed also recently. So thank you very much again for participating also to the speakers, Jürgen Trittin uh, and also uh, our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for assisting Professor Pflüger and I hand over the word back to you. And again, please forgive me that I was late today. Thank you. Well, we're happy to have you. And uh, uh, thank you for your words, uh, also support for, for CASAS. We know that you uh, have been supportive from the first uh, moment, uh, also on uh, bringing the users uh, European cluster for energy, climate and resource security from King's College uh, to here. And uh, we continue to, to work with you in the, in the future, hopefully. And uh, uh, well, to Professor Celani and Jürgen Trittin, uh, those uh, introductions are important as CASAS is pretty new and it has to find its place in the university structure. And therefore we use these opportunities uh, to, well, also with the, with the state government of Nordrhein-Westphalia to put everything in place uh, on track and I think we are on a, on a good way with, with Cassis and uh, Professor Schlie and Professor Kuhnberg. But now we, we really turn to our issue. Uh, it, it, well, of course, Ursula has already mentioned the very important points, but, but we now deep dive into water issues. And I can not, I, I don't know of anybody else who could be uh, more, um, well suited to do this than uh, Professor Brahma Chilani. He is an old friend. Um, presently, he is a, a professor uh, in New Delhi, professor for strategic studies at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, where he uh, is uh, right now in the moment, but he's also a Richard von Weizsäcker fellow at the Robert Bosch Institute. Uh, at the Academy in Berlin, and uh, he's an affiliate uh, professor at, the, at King's College London as well. So we have him in different functions. Uh, I should mention that he has been teaching uh, and doing research at uh, Brookings, at Harvard's, at John Hopkins, uh, Australian University, many places around the world, has written nine books on water issues, so uh, I think he's really one of the leading, if not the leading water expert uh, that we have uh, on this planet. And to have him in this seminar is, is a great honor for us, Brahma. Uh, we, we're very happy to have you. And uh, well, we're looking forward to, to you uh, uh, highlighting a few important issues for the students and the broader audience, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fluger, for that uh, kind introduction. In fact, um, the minister has um, given a very good introduction to water issues and the importance of water management. The rector also underscored the importance of water. So we've had uh, two good introductions already on the issues relating to water. 
what I intend to do is to provide the global perspective on water, especially as to why the hydropolitics has become increasingly murky. What is causing the sharpening hydropolitics to, to help you understand why the geopolitics of water is, is, is murky. I want to present the bigger picture. Water has become the world's most exploited natural resource. It has led to shortages already in about two thirds of the world. Yet paradoxically, water remains the world's most uh, underappreciated, undervalued and underpriced resource. Water, as you know, is a renewable resource, but it's a finite resource. The reason why it's a finite resource is because nature has a fixed capacity to replenish water every year. That water replenishment capacity of nature limits the world's renewable freshwater resources to about 43,000 billion cubic meters per year. That is a maximum theoretical amount of water available under natural conditions, excluding human influence and the effects of climate change. Water is actually a unique natural resource. Let me begin with a simple truth. We can live without love but not without water. Isn't that true? They are substitutes for a number of other natural resources. For example, if there is no oil, we can use electricity, but there's no substitute for water. We cannot replace water with anything else. Countries can import, even from distant lands, fossil fuels, mineral ores, and resources from the biosphere but they cannot import the most vital of all resources, water. Certainly not in a major or lasting manner. Water is essentially local. Not many know this. Water is about 20% heavier than oil. Therefore, it is very expensive to ship water across seas. To be sure, some countries have tried to import water. For example, in 2008, a severe drought forced Spain's Barcelona region to import water from France through tankers. But the import proved so expensive, it cost millions of euros or about three US dollars per cubic meter that the government of Catalonia province decided to invest in building desalination plants to meet future water needs. When history is written, the year 2020 will be, will be remembered for the COVID-19 shock. The present pandemic has underscored the importance of water. Water is central to fighting any pandemic or preventing the outbreak of disease. Unclean water is the greatest killer on the globe, claiming thousands of children's lives every day. Now, let me take you through some slides very quickly in order to present the global picture. This may help you to have a better understanding uh, of why hydropolitics is so murky. Just a moment, um, let me just set it up. Um, can, can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. good. Okay. Um, as you can see from this first slide that water resources are very unequally and unevenly distributed in the world. 
the driest continent in the world is Asia. That may explain as to why the hydropolitics in Asia is particularly murky. Now this chart shows the water availability in the world's top 15 economies. Canada and Brazil are the Saudi Arabia's of the freshwater world. They, are, they have such a high availability in per capita terms. And then you have South Korea and India at the bottom. Germany doesn't appear well endowed, though the province of North Rhine, Westphalia uh, is uh, pretty water rich. But overall, despite um, Germany's modest water resources, Germany copes well because of smart water management. Now this map shows the relative water stress at present. The areas shaded in yellow represent the areas that are suffering from extreme water stress. These are the most uh, crit critically placed areas. And the areas that are shaded dark blue have high water stress. So these yellow areas and the dark blue areas represent the areas that are suffering from serious or extreme water stress. As you will notice from this map that some of the most, some of the worst affected areas, the most water scarce areas in the world are in the Islamic world. The Islamic world stretches from the Maghreb and Sahel in North Africa to the Arabian Sea region. And this particular chart gives you some of the countries that are the poorest states in aggregate water resources, except for Malta, almost, all, almost the other countries are part of the Islamic arc which I just mentioned from, from North Africa to the Arabian Sea region. And the water availability in these countries, all of them, is just a fraction of 1% of the availability in Canada or Brazil. So it tells you how unevenly distributed water resources are globally. Another aspect about water resources is that, is that water flows in all regions cross national boundaries. Water essentially is a shared resource. And therefore, competition over shared resources creates grating geopolitics. Now, in this particular map, the arrows show the direction in which the river flows are going and the figures represent the total flows in cubic kilometers per year. The Rhine and, 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 and Bond sits of the Rhine, the, the Rhine crosses 10 different countries in Western Europe. Another major European river, the Danube, um, flows through 10 countries, you know, the Rhine through six countries and the Danube through 10 countries. And, and, and most large rivers traverse multiple countries. And, and that's true of Asia too. We are seeing water wars right now being waged, not in a military sense, but in a political, diplomatic or economic sense. But a US government report reflecting the assessment of US intelligence agencies has warned of real water wars, water wars in a military sense in the coming years. And this report was uh, published in 2012. And since that report appeared, we know that um, the hydropolitics have become increasingly uh, sharp, especially in parts of the world, especially in Asia and the Middle East, 
there the competition over shared resources is, um, is visibly sharpening. I mentioned that water wars are raging in political, diplomatic, or economic sense. But that does not mean that water wars in a military sense have not happened. In fact, military, water wars in a military sense have happened in modern history. If you look at this map, you, you can see that all of almost all of Asia's great rivers originate from the same area, the Tibetan Plateau, right? Now the Tibetan Plateau was annexed by China in 1951. So the annexation of the Tibetan Plateau changed the water map of Asia. It made China the upstream controller of multiple riverheads. China now has 18 downstream neighbors. No country in the world matches China's hydro hegemony. Its, um, it's uh, control over riverheads is unmatched anywhere in the world. So here is an example of how the annexation of a water rich region changed the, the water map of an entire continent. To give you another example, this is from the Middle East. This is a map of Israel and its neighbors. In 1967, in a six day war, in a six day war, Israel changed the water map of its sub region by occupying the Golan Heights, which is the source of the Jordan River waters, and by capturing the aquifer controlling West Bank. The West Bank sits on groundwater, on aquifer basins. So by capturing the Golan Heights and the West Bank, Israel in one stroke went from being dependent on its neighbors for water to becoming the controller of water resources in its sub-region. Now this is a map of the Mekong River. The Mekong River starts in, in the Tibetan Plateau and then flows into Southeast Asia where it serves as a lifeline for multiple countries including Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. On this river, China has built 11 mega dams, mega dams, just before this river flows into Southeast Asia. Now those mega dams are causing recurrent droughts in downstream countries. And more importantly, because of its upstream hydro infrastructure, China is able to control downstream flows and thus exercise tremendous leverage over the downriver countries. This is also a water war. You know, when you build dams upstream, make yourself the upstream water controller, you are effectively arming yourself. You're weaponizing water and arming yourself with the ability to regulate downstream flows. And in other words, you're trying to ensure that the countries downstream bend to your will. Because if they don't bend to your will, you may not release sufficient amount of water for them. This particular cartoon explains the plight of the countries located downstream. China is sitting pretty, having built this huge infrastructure of dams and the countries that are located downstream have little option but to play nice or else they may not get their share of water. So in a nutshell, that tells you the picture of how water resources today are increasingly the target of competition instead of being the target of cooperation among core riparian states. Against this background, you may like to ask as to how 
the struggle for water can be prevented from becoming a tipping point for overt conflict or from causing seriously disruptive social and economic impacts? The short answer is by establishing at the geopolitical level norms and institutions to promote rules-based cooperation on shared water resources, and at the community level, by utilizing new technologies and innovative water management. There are three possible pathways to addressing the water challenges. But before I tell you the pathways, it's important to bear in mind that traditional supply side measures are running into natural limitations because water resources are already overexploited. It's no longer possible in many areas to increase the rate of water extraction from rivers and aquifers. This underscores the imperative to develop non-traditional supply sources, that is unconventional supply sources. If you take the oil and gas sector, what has proved to be a game changer in recent years, it is the tapping of unconventional sources such as shale and tar sands. Likewise, in the water sector, we must explore and develop all unconventional options. The unconventional options principally are in three areas. The first is using new technologies to open up new supply sources, including ocean water, that is sea water, brackish water, which is salty water found in coastal areas and or found in hinterland, recycled wastewater, and atmospheric water. Now to tap these new sources of water, the energy intensity of technologies used to be a major concern in the past. But technological advancements have improved the energy water ratio, thus increasing the commercial feasibility and attraction of utilizing new supply sources. These new sources of supply, however, still remain relatively more expensive. The second pathway centers on achieving greater water use efficiency and productivity through methods that control wasteful practices. This is particularly true of agriculture, which uses approximately 70% of the world's freshwater supply. So the greatest potential for easing the water crisis is through practices that cut the amount of water channeled for farm and livestock production. And the third pathway is expanding and, and, and enhancing the water infrastructure so as to build distribution efficiency and to correct spatial and seasonal imbalances in water availability. In many parts of the world, there's too much water in the rainy season, too little water in the dry season, or some areas in a country have too much water, some other areas don't have enough water. So correcting these imbalances is important. For example, seasonal imbalances in water availability can be mitigated by storing water in the wet season, including through rainwater harvesting and releasing that water for use in the dry season. However, the biggest challenge that we face today is hydropolitics. The sharpening hydropolitics has turned shared water resources into an engine of power struggle, with some countries seeking to weaponize the most vital of all the natural resources. So how can we avert water wars? Averting water wars demands four things. First, rules-based cooperation. Second, water sharing arrangements. Those could be water sharing treaties or other arrangements. Third is uninterrupted flow of hydrological data between countries. Hydrological data is data 
that relates to river flows. And that data is very useful for controlling, you know, for uh, getting forewarnings of floods, for, um, for addressing uh, likely drought conditions, etc. And the fourth important element is dispute settlement mechanisms. Disputes will arise even when countries cooperate. So even if countries are in cooperative relationship, it's important to have dispute settlement mechanisms. So when disputes arise, they can be resolved peacefully. In other words, transparency, collaboration, sharing, and dispute settlement are the building blocks of water peace. Let me stop here. Over to you, Professor Fluker. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brahma, for this uh, extremely enlightening uh, and precise uh, introduction. Well, I, I would say it, uh, it gives uh, to the student and the participants a lot of, of knowledge and insight. Uh, while we discussed many of these issues uh, in our seminar, and uh, students are working on these issues, it uh, gave us an uh, overview and uh, a strategic outlook on uh, the, uh, well, on, on, on the dimension of this problem and of possibilities to solve it. So, so thank you very much. And, and let us, uh, before I come to Jürgen 13, let me tell, especially our students, but everybody who is participating, uh, please use the chat function uh, if you want to comment. And I'd be very happy if you would uh, use this opportunity to talk to uh, Tratin and Brahma Celani um, about these issues, ask your questions, uh, make your points. So use the chat function uh, for, uh, for uh, letting me know uh, that, you, that you want to have the floor. Uh, and now I turn to, to Jürgen Tratin. Um, uh, I have uh, known Jürgen since uh, the late 70s. Uh, I was uh, chairman, national chairman of the Ring Christlich Demokratischer Studenten, and he was the head of the Initiative Committee zur Gründung eines Kommunistischen Hochschulbundes. So we came from very different angles. Uh, and uh, well, since then, and, and in the last years, increasingly, I have, uh, well, got to know Jürgen as someone who seriously addresses very important issues, especially on the, but not only on the environmental front, also on the foreign affairs front. Uh, as you know, he was a state minister in Lower Saxony under Gerhard Schröder uh, in, the, in the 90s. And then, uh, well, in 1998, he became the federal minister for the environment for, uh, well, also nuclear safety and uh, the uh, conservation of the nature. So uh, over these seven years, uh, well, he did a lot to, to, uh, to uh, coin, to characterize the politics of, of Germany. So if you see all these uh, Brahma, these, uh, these windmills that you see in, in Jürgen's uh, picture behind him, uh, well, that we have so many windmills uh, offshore and onshore has a lot to do with him. That we are phasing out nuclear, uh, whether you like it or not, has a lot to do with him. Uh, so, uh, well, I believe that he is uh, one of those uh, you may like it or not, uh, who has coined this country, who has uh, put a mark on it. And uh, well, since uh, uh, he left office as a minister, he was uh, the head of the parliamentary group of the Greens. Uh, and then since 2014, he's a, a ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the German Bundestag. And uh, again, I, I think he's important in the German Bundestag, and it's a great pleasure, Jürgen, to, to have you here and uh, comment on Professor Celani and give you and the students your views. You're also Thank muted. You. Thank you, Brahma Celani, for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Ursula. Hello uh, to everyone. Mm. 
if you take a look on the UN Water Report in 2020, this report started with a fact. Around 1 million animal and plant species are facing extinction. And freshwater species have suffered the greatest decline, falling by 84% since 1970. I start with that not because in my personal lifetime, I was also responsible for nature conservation. But you see that we have a development. Around 4 billion people currently experience severe physical water scarcity. And these crises, these water crises, is exaggerated by climate change effects. That is one with a view to the global water resources, look at the Himalaya and the Tibet aquifer. Uh, Brahman uh, uh, showed us before, but also it's a threatening sustainable social economic development. And all these has profound implications to water resources. I want to have a short view on the relations between climate crisis and water crisis and on the differences and the comments of fighting climate change and, de and developing what Brahman called hydropolitics. It's obvious that climate change affects ecosystems. The crisis is going on much faster as all predictions have been. As I started attending climate conferences, all these prognoses for the end of this century have to be put forward. For example, if you look on the melting process of uh, glaciers, if you see what's happening in Siberia, all these things came earlier than expected. On the other side, climate change also affects the scarcity of water. The US military strategy under Obama calls climate change on a very prominent position a threat multiplier. This was abolished by Donald Trump. Perhaps it will come back with Biden and John Kerry. But it's not that simple. It's not, it's becoming too hot and then you find the war. Threat multiplier needs a medium. And the medium for the threat multiplier clim uh, uh, climate change is water. If you look on the catastrophic droughts, nine years until now in Syria, you see one of the reasons in this conflict. Nearly a million Syrian people had to leave the rural areas where they lived before, went to the cities and sharpened the problems of an injustice and bad governed authoritarian system up to war. And this is something we see Rama also pointed to that so-called Islamic arc. But we see this crisis in the direct neighborhood of Europe, not only in Syria. Look at Saal with the vanishing Lake Chad Look on the conflicts in Sudan between settlers, uh, farmers, and hearts uh, in, in Darfur. And therefore, it's obvious if we don't limit global heating, the water crisis will increase, and the conflicts and wars will increase. 
the question we have to answer is are two more. What are strategies beyond mitigation of greenhouse gases to avoid such water wars? And are there differences between combating the climate crisis and water? For sure, uh, Brahman pointed to it. Efficiency and saving strategies play a big role in climate as in water politics. Access to technology may be to high efficient motors or may it be in drip irrigation or question of recycling and reuse play a big role in the field of climate as in the field of water policy. But there is a real difference. WC Fields, the actor from the beginning of the film, uh, cinema century, was wrong. He was quoted with the sentence, I don't drink water because fish fuck in it. That means coal, oil, and uranium can be substituted by renewable energies but not water. It's, as Brahma pointed out, it's a renewable resource, but very finite. No water, no whiskey, that's the bad message for WC field. So the question of the absolute limitations of the amount of water plays in hydropolitics much more a role than in the question of combating climate change. Combating climate crisis means not to use existing fossil resources. Dealing with water raises much more the question of global, fair and just share. And this global, fair and just share is becoming more complicated because there are areas in the world where you don't have a problem of water and there are areas who have a severe problem. So you need a very, very regional approach to solve a global problem. In that field, climate policy and water policy can help each other. Limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius help to slow the glaciers and therefore the loss of sweet water. This can lower the tensions between China, Nepal, India or Bhutan on China. But I think it's not only in that case. There is also a responsibility for the countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Our way of life with the consumption of meat or with those who favor a vegan lifestyle, eating avocados, lead to the absurd situation that water rich countries in the North are importing virtual water from semi-arid regions. So here we have to change. Or give me another, a positive example. Conservation of wetlands save water. But these conservation also are saving the storage for greenhouse gas emission, for, for greenhouse gases. So I think a new hydropolitics brings policy back to the stage. With nature's laws, you cannot negotiate. That's the simple truth on the enrichment of CO2 in the atmosphere. But for example, between Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt, you can negotiate what means 
water diplomacy is different to climate diplomacy. It's more regional, despite it is tackling a global problem. And Brahman, in his impressive input, told us the shared resource water gives us upstream, gives upstream countries an advantage. This is very much different to the excesses like oil and gas. But what means this for the future, for a decarbonized, highly renewable, relying economy and the ongoing problem of water? Both tendencies strengthen China's position. So the answer must be, we need a global new governance on water. This is the core of a new hydro politics. And I very much support all the practical advices Brahman gave us. Thank you very much. Jürgen, we, we thank you very much uh, for uh, also giving us a, a great, great insight and uh, contributing substantially. Um, well, I understand Brahma wants to comment on a few issues, but uh, let me first turn to, uh, to the audience and ask others to join in. I have uh, Peter Olesak uh, and I have uh, Christina Skopek. Uh, with questions or comments. Um, I, I hope it will be technically possible that you that you uh, uh, talk directly to Professor Cholani or to Jürgen Trittin. Uh, Peter, would you like to start? Well, it's obviously not uh, possible, then, then uh, I would uh, uh, ask uh, Christina to bring her question also in a written form uh, in, in, into the chat function and uh, take the question of uh, Peter Olesak uh, to, uh, to Professor Celani. Um, Brahma, would you also be drafting an UN Convention on Water Flows comparable to Elizabeth Mann Borghese Treaty on the Law of the Seas. And further, you address the unconventional water resources, including atmospheric water. Looking in geopolitical terms ahead a bit, would this be a possible source for the harvesting of water on other planets? And then he uh, nicely says, seasons greeting to India. So uh, Brahma, please. Well, uh, to be brief, um, there's already a UN water course convention that was drafted and agreed upon in 1997. It came into force more recently because um, the ratification process was slow uh, of the parties that agreed to be part of it. However, the upstream powers in the world are not, have not joined this UN Water Course Convention. So you have, you have the lower riparian states, a number of them that are, that are parties to the UN Water Course Convention, but not the key states, countries like Turkey, countries like you know, China, countries that are uh, regional hydrohegemons, um, they are missing. So unless the key parties, the key countries do not join, this water course um, convention of the UN will remain uh, toothless. Um, atmospheric water is the newest of um, new sources uh, in terms of um, technological developments. Um, it's, um, air, you know, air has humidity and you can extract uh, water from air. Uh, and technologies have emerged in recent years that are quite effective in um, harnessing atmospheric water. 
the issue really has been the energy water ratio. Uh, most of these uh, new technologies, including desalination technologies, tend to be quite energy intensive. So if you are in Saudi Arabia, you know, you can use um, oil, which is uh, cheaper than uh, water for Saudi Arabia to desalinate uh, seawater. But for many other countries, that was not possible, right? But now the costs have come down for desalination, but desalination is still not at the same level as conventional water. But atmospheric water generation still remains uh, expensive. However, it's a very useful technology when suddenly contamination happens in, in, you know, in, in water supply or there is a natural disaster and uh, water supply is disrupted, this technology can offer uh, emergency supply. Uh, and, and the issue really is whether in the long run, atmospheric water generation can become an economically feasible option for everyday use. Only time will tell, but certainly this is one promising technology Thank Back you, you Professor Thank you. Um, I have a, a question now from uh, Christina Skolpek, a, a student of, of, of ours. Uh, she asked the question, uh, Professor Celani, do you see right now um, the danger of foreign conflict? Uh, is there right now a situation where you would say water uh, at least could contribute uh, to, to a real war, and where would you say is this situation happening? Well, <clears throat> there, the, the two aspects, you know, one is what um, Mr. Tritton mentioned, the sustainable development aspect that relates to water resource utilization. Conflict can happen when uses of water become unsustainable or the uses cause degradation in rivers, lakes, and aquifers. That can lead to conflict between communities and between nations. But in today's context, the possibility of water wars is um, quite real. It's real in terms of what we see in uh, Northern uh, Africa between Ethiopia and, and Egypt. Egypt is located furthest downstream on the Nile River. The Nile flows through nearly a dozen countries, but Egypt has been utilizing more than 80% of the waters of the Nile River so far and claims a historic entitlement to continue to use the bulk of the Nile waters. So when a country like Ethiopia located upstream decides to utilize some of the water resources for its own use, Egypt even threatened military retaliation against Ethiopia. That was one example. But the biggest danger of water war is between China and India. Now these are two large countries they make up um, one third of the global population or so. And China recently announced that it's going to dam the Brahmaputra River, which flows into India and Bangladesh. Just before this river enters India, it plans to build a dam even bigger than Three Gorges Dam. The Three Gorges Dam is the world's largest dam, but China has early this month announced that it plans to build something even bigger than Three Gorges Dam, just as this river crosses into India. Now, this is a declaration of water war on India. And worse is that the biggest impact will be borne by Bangladesh because it's located furthest downstream on this river. Environmental havoc in Bangladesh would mean that millions of more refugees will 
migrate to India, which is already home to something like 16 million illegally settled Bangladeshis. So India is going to face a double whammy in terms of one impact, in terms of what China does, and a second impact that, that occurs because of environmental havoc in Bangladesh. Now that is one example where a real water war uh, seems to be emerging. Thank you so much. I have now four uh, uh, speakers and I would uh, suggest that they ask their questions one by one and then uh, Jürgen and Brahma uh, answer. Uh, Annabelle Woodret, uh, I would like to start with, Professor Woodret. Then we have uh, Diego Java, we have uh, Yannick Florian Thies, and we have uh, Mr. Olesak, who uh, already asked one question. So please, Annabelle. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Pflüger. This is Annabelle Houdre from the German Development Institute and the One Water Network. I would like to get the panelists' view on the role of non-state actors for conflict prevention, because we have several examples where they contribute to confidence and uh, to peace building initiatives, such as uh, the one by the Friends of the Earth Middle East between communities and Palestine and Israel, then parts of the Nile Basin Commission that focus on civil societies between riparians, etc. So do they have any credit in your view or does all this not matter at all in front of uh, foreign policies and the military decisions taken uh, by riparian states? Okay, uh, then uh, next one is uh, Diego Yaba. Diego, please. Many thanks. And I hope you can also introduce me. yourself briefly. Thank you very much. So my name is Diego Jara. I'm a legal officer at the IUCN Environmental Law Center located also in Bonn, Germany. Many thanks for this opportunity to ask a question. Thank you as well for the two presentations that were really informative. I just have a very short question. How to ensure proper transboundary water cooperation if there is no political will, both at the global and basin, basin level, in the case of the UN Water Courses Convention, as um, it was already mentioned, if you don't have the hydro hegemons uh, being part of this convention, Brazil, for instance, or China, and in the same for the Mekong River Agreement, where there is this agreement in place for this river, but also China being the water tower, not being part of this. Uh, and I just did this uh, question because there is a, a main river there as well, the Salween River, with no agreement at all. What could be done in the case of, of this river, a flea flowing river, where there can be dams and there is no agreement? Many thanks. Thank you so much. I would like to take now uh, Yannick Florian Thies and then Peter Olesak, and I uh, finish this first round with Dave Merkel. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, I am a student in the seminar. Um, and my question is, um, as you mentioned, the consumption of meat and avocados and other things, um, whether you think that there should be a water tax similar to a carbon tax, which prices the uh, the usage of water into the price of the products that, or maybe even the services that we, that we buy and use in our daily lives. Thank you. Um, then uh, please, Peter Olesak. Peter, we don't hear you. You are muted, obviously. Well, if you're not coming, I, I turn to Dave Merkel. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. I'm a student in the seminar as well. My question um, is like, which role does private players play in the international water conflict? Like especially the influence from private players on the national government um, yeah, in the water conflict. Thanks. Okay, and uh, there's a question to Jürgen Trittin uh, from Peter Olesak, which, which uh, who has a uh, uh, put in his uh, question in, in written form in the chat function. Uh, Mr. Trittin, uh, is regional water diplomacy already established as an instrument in global policy? So, so those were the questions. And uh, well, I would like to start with Jürgen. Uh, you're uh, muted. Sorry. 
there are very small elements on the participation of several society. You are right that in many cases for questions of reconciliation, moderation, and also the participation of civil society is crucial. But in that overheated conflict situation, as we see now between Ethiopia and Egypt, between China, India, and China, and the Indo-Chinese states. This conflict is on a level where I fear that uh, civil society will become victim and not actor in this conflict. On the question that always causes these conflicts, like the dam on the Brahmaputra, you see all the time civil society who are the losers of this infrastructure project. That is the reason why in the very, very flexible, not very binding convention on dams, there is a part of civil society. But I think if you want to strengthen political solutions, diplomacy, governance, you will have to strengthen the role, especially of the local population and the civil groups there. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, this is also uh, an answer to uh, the question, what's about water diplomacy? I think Brahma Chalani started with the sentence that water, in my words, is too cheap. That's right. And we see all over on this globe. Everywhere where water, even if it's scarcity, is very cheap. Not the normal people are the winners of that. If you look, for example, on flower farming in Kenya by Dutch companies. It's very cheap to get the water for them. So that is the reason why they changed from the Netherlands to Kenya. So I think we need, in a perspective, a system of prices that reflects the real costs, and especially those costs here are the costs of destroying these finite resource. So that's whether this will be a tax or something different, trading systems or so, it's, it's it's not my, I'm, we, we all in, in environment policy like to discuss on instruments, but I think the principle is relevant that we need a price that includes all external costs, also the costs of environmental damage. Brahma, please. There were <clears throat> two questions uh, that were related, one on non-state actors, and whether it was on private players, let, the, let me take those two questions together. Non-state actors slash private players are very important. Non-governmental organizations, for example, can play a useful role. In democracies, especially large democracies in Asia, to give examples of Japan and India, NGOs have uh, made it virtually impossible to build giant dams. Uh, in India, for example, um, the government efforts to launch large dam projects have run into grassroots resistance because of NGOs. You know, they, these environmental NGOs have been <laughs> in, um, spearheading agitations against um, environmentally damaging projects. But in autocracies, 
the role of non-state actors or private players is, uh, is at, at best marginal. The issue really is as to how non-state actors or private players can play a productive role in shaping water for peace. There, I think the challenge is more difficult because as you know, water resources are largely controlled by governments. They also set policy terms. And um, in many countries, control of water resources is linked with national security. So anything that where national security comes into the picture, the, the role of non-state actors or private players to play a productive role gets um, minimized. So we have to find ways uh, in which non-state actors can play a bigger role in issues that relate to water and water management. Then there were questions about transboundary cooperation in the absence of political will. Uh, regional water diplomacy was another question. I think uh, let's first look at the bigger picture to know, to know what's at stake. And, and, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Clinton pointed this out that the future of human civilization hinges on sustainable development. If resources like water are degraded and depleted, environmental refugees will follow. Humans have wiped out 80% of all the wetlands. They have driven 25% of all bird species and many large mammal species to extinction. <coughs> and they have altered or degraded 75% of Earth's land. Degradation of water resources has resulted in aquatic ecosystems losing half of their biodiversity since just the mid 1970s. And one subject that gets very little attention is groundwater depletion. When countries overexploit rivers or lakes, users then turn to extracting groundwater and the water table is falling you know, deeper and deeper. People have to dig much, much deeper to access groundwater. And groundwater depletion is affecting natural stream flows, wetlands, lakes, and related ecosystems. So we are quoting an environmental disaster. And people don't understand that unlike rivers, groundwater depletion or groundwater contamination is not visible to human eye. So wrong practices, reckless practices continue just because such, such as the impacts of such practices are not visible to the human eye. But to specifically answer the question as to how there can be transboundary cooperation in the abs absence of political will, the short answer is they cannot be. The, the very basis of transboundary cooperation is political will. If there's no political will to cooperate, if there's no political will to stem environmental degradation or degradation of uh, water resources, then uh, the degradation will continue. Um, the Mekong River Commission in Southeast Asia offers an institutional mechanism to pursue sustainable harnessing of the resources of the Mekong River. The problem is that the Mekong River Commission includes all the downstream countries, but not the upstream part, China. China has refused to join the Mekong River Commission because joining the Mekong River Commission means taking on legally binding commitments. So China chooses not to be bound by any legal commitment and has not joined the MRC. The Salvin River was mentioned. The Salvin River is one of the last free flowing rivers in the world. And China is now about to begin building <coughs> dams on the Salvan River, on the Salvin River, especially in the downstream areas 
in, in cooperation with a couple of downstream countries, that, you know, that would be an, another, um, uh, you know, serious mistake because uh, free flowing rivers are essential to combating climate change. They are very important in, um, in, in fighting climate change. As far as regional water diplomacy is concerned, I think regional water diplomacy is an, should be an extension of regional cooperation or building sustainable cooperation because you cannot build sustainable cooperation um, without reaching out to other players in the region. Your sustainable cooperation means multilateral cooperation in a region and regional water diplomacy has to be at the center of such an effort. Let me stop here. Well, th thank you uh, so much. Oh, yes, we have, yes. Yeah, uh, there was uh, one, one other question I forgot. Please, uh, go ahead. Um, it was about, um, if I understood the question was about uh, water and meat uh, and about tax. Um, and I think it's a very important question because uh, Rising incomes have promoted changing diets, especially a greater intake of meat, whose production is notoriously water intensive. Production of meat on average is 10 times more water intensive than plant-based calories and proteins. If uh, the world stopped diverting food to feed livestock, it could not only abolish hunger, but also feed a 4 billion larger population, according to a study done at the University of Minnesota. So our changing diets, especially if you look at Asia in China, South Korea, or Southeast Asia, traditional diets have been transformed in the last one generation alone. They have become much meatier. In Europe, the diets have changed over the last 100 years. If you go back, to what the European diet was at the beginning of the 20th century and compare that with the diet today, you will know that it's become a much meatier diet. But in Asia, the diets have changed in just one generation. And this is having a real impact on the environment and on natural resources. The issue about tax and all, you know, is, is a larger question. Uh, it's, it's about government's role, role of government in promoting healthy diets. Should governments promote healthy diets, just the way governments have um, sought to mm. inculcate a, a sense that smoking is dangerous for health, right? The governments are playing a role in discouraging smoking. Should governments also discourage eating of, um, eating of foods of, you know, of consumption of diets that are unhealthy? And this is a uh, sensitive question, requires larger debate, but uh, this is a question that needs to be debated in the context of sustainable development. Thank you. This is not a dispute between us. I think Friedbert is convinced since he is living. But pr promoting a more healthy, more vegan or vegetable uh, 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 diet has caused some problems. I re remind you on the discussion on the so-called veggie day in Germany. <laughs> yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> That's even why I, I, didn't, I didn't go beyond, uh, you know, a, a certain level. <laughs> well, uh, it's not enough. It's true, I don't have to be convinced. Uh, my suggestion now is uh, I have uh, three more speakers, J.D. Bindenagel, Aras Duro, uh, again, Dave Merkel, if someone wants to raise uh, the hand and ask for the floor, it's the, la the very last chance to do this now. And then uh, I would uh, probably also ask a question. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, Jürgen and Brahma commenting. And uh, at the end of the day, we will have a final word from the Henry Kissinger Professor Ulrich Lee. So, um, JD, JD Bindenagel, please, would you also be so kind to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm delighted to, and, and thank you, uh, Friedberg, for uh, the opportunity to join into your seminar. It's very, very fascinating. Uh, JD, we, we, we just 
JD, we don't hear you. JD? Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you. you the very... last thing we heard was that the seminar was fascinating and you don't have to repeat that. And somebody took me back and somebody didn't want to hear the, the rest of what I had to say, clearly. <laughs> anyway, sorry. First of all, let me just say it's a really very informative, intellectually stimulating and very, very important uh, topic and discussion. But I'd like to pick up on two things that were raised. One <clears throat> uh, that uh, Dr. Brahma raised about political will and the second about national security. When uh, you see the conflicts and there are fascinating conflicts in Southeast Asia and in between China and India and in, certainly in Ethiopia and, in, and, uh, <clears throat> and Egypt, but certainly in the Middle East. If you think in political terms, the question then that I have is who's, who's going to uh, take the lead on debating these issues and informing the politics of these issues? If it shouldn't it also be a role for Europe and in that regard, shouldn't it be a role for Germany that has an Africa policy that is very concerned about the Middle East and North Africa that should take a lead to talk about strategic thoughts about what all these mean for national security. That's really a question to you, Jürgen. And I know you, you have views on this, but <clears throat> isn't it not a role for Germany to take on these issues, informing the public, having debates? You don't have to make policy yet. You have to first inform the policy makers themselves. So that's my question. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, JD. As you did not introduce yourself, let me just say a few words. To those who don't know you, you have been an American, a leading American diplomat for uh, quite a few decades. And uh, then you were the first Henry Kissinger professor at the University of Bonn. And uh, you helped uh, together with uh, Dekan Kronenberg and uh, others to establish this CASIS. Uh, so, so thanks for participating. And uh, uh, next speaker is Aris Duo. Uh, thank you. I'd first like to thank uh, Brahma and uh, Mr. Tritin uh, for your very interesting insights. Uh, really a fascinating discussion. Um, just uh, two questions probably aimed at both of you. Um, so recently a water futures contract was introduced in California, which kind of highlights the water scarcity concern. So I have two questions. Um, mm -hmm. One, do you think that this trend will continue on a global scale with water joining oil, gold, and perhaps also other commodities and being traded on major exchanges? And uh, number two, and if so, um, do you think that this mechanism could actually help serve as a scarcity gauge and perhaps also as a hedge against water price fluctuations, um, which could then, I guess, um, also help prevent future conflicts? And one comment, since uh, we were talking about diets and meat, I think, um, I think we have to Tread the water a bit more carefully here in the sense that, uh, for instance, I actually recently read a very um, interesting uh, report on NPR about the high fat um, diets of Inuits in the Arctic region. Uh, and, uh, you know, researchers were extremely surprised that they actually have very low rates of heart disease and diabetes despite the high meat diet. And after actually looking into that a bit more deeply, they actually saw that it just, um, the reason for that is the genetic adaptations. So over thousands of years, different people's genetic, you know, makeup is involved um, to adapt to their diets. So I don't think there's, you know, a one size fits all type of solution as far as promoting, you know, vegetable or plant-based diet and saying this is healthy for everyone. Um, just a comment on the side. Thanks. Thank you so much. Because Arash also did not introduce himself, let me just say he's a, a principal in my a private uh, company and my, my uh, strategic uh, consultancy. And he's uh, also a research fellow uh, here uh, at, uh, at, at CASAS, at the European Cluster for Energy and Resource Security, a longtime associate. And uh, thank you very much, Arash, also for helping uh, set this whole seminar up and uh, giving it some uh, insight and and content. Uh, Dave Merkel is next. Dave. Yeah, sorry oh, for the oh, inconvenience. Dave. I 
think there was a misunderstanding. I don't have another question. Quite okay. Satisfied. Thanks. Okay, okay. Then, then, then uh, uh, let, let me ask uh, one more question to to both of you. Could you? Um, well, we we see that water is a is a danger, and that we can water scarcity, that it can lead to war, and that it uh, can uh, enhance uh, potential or already existing conflicts. Um, but what is with the opposite? Uh, do we have examples, and could you elaborate a little bit more on them, uh, where uh, things are going good, where we have examples where water perhaps uh, led to constructive management uh, of conflicts, as we have energy in the foreign affairs uh, arena uh, playing, well, also both, uh, on both sides. It can lead to wars uh, uh, and conflicts, but it can also smoothen conflicts if you have a cooperation. Uh, for instance, uh, Turkey and Armenia, uh, well, two countries which are not uh, uh, very nice with each other normally, but uh, they have managed, as far as we see, to reach some understanding. Here we have some lessons learned. Uh, do you have other examples, and could you dive a little bit in the in the stability uh, uh, enhancing uh, possibility of water as well? So those are the questions, and uh, I think if we now give. Uh, both speakers, uh, the floor, and then Ulrich uh, at the end of, of the seminar, we will have a Punktlandung. Uh, so uh, if you allow me, I would uh, like to start with Jürgen and then come to Brahma. I think it's right that water is not only a problem, also can be a chance for international cooperation or regional cooperation. <coughs> What we see along the Rhine River is complicated, but is working from Switzerland down uh, to, to, to the Netherlands, despite we have this upstream downstream conflict uh, to, to implement uh, a basins uh, uh, in, in the upstream area to protect downstream is not very popular, but more or less it's working under the condition in center uh, center Europe. Um, I'm tot I totally agree that uh, Germany and the European Union has to change its behavior to their southern and southeast neighbors. We have to be very clear that the withdrawal, the lowering of engagement of the US in that region. That means Sahel up to Syria, Iraq, will go on also with Biden. And that means the Europeans can't no longer rely on the US in the good or in the bad in that region. So, we have to do more. We have to overcome this form of what we call in German attentismus. Uh, we won't do that in the first step because we are not able to deliver that capacities primarily on a military sector. But we are able to have a strong economic leverage and we have some experience even from the U European Union itself, how to deal with conflicting interests on a compromising and negotiated way. And this is something what I expect will be the big foreign policy challenge for a new German government to overcome the total passivity from the actual, sorry for that, uh, uh, foreign minister in that region. And that includes also questions of solving the conflicts of interest on water, uh, on the consequences of the climate crisis and so on. Uh, yes, it's true that the scarcity of the uh, commodity of water will go on, even in regions that have 
haven't known this for a long time. If I look on the third drought in the third year in Brandenburg, we can see very clearly what's happening here. If you look what's happening in the German forests, we have to change our way of making forestry. These things will go on. I don't believe that it will cause a conflict. The last remark I want to make to the diet question, I was not talking about healthy diet. I was just talking on the consumption of water and the consequences of deforestation that's responsible for 20% of global <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions. What's healthy or not, I'm not a doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bram. Um, let me take the questions in the reverse order. So I'll start with the question that you asked, Professor Kluger, of examples of um, water, water as an instrument of peace between countries. I think the best example I can think of relates to the water sharing arrangements between the US and Canada. The two countries share many rivers. They also share the Great Lakes and they have an institutionalized arrangement, a legal framework to manage their shared resources. Now, the reason why that arrangement works very well is that water management is embedded in a larger political and security framework between the US and Canada. Where such a larger political and security framework is missing, then even good water treaties don't make much of a difference. India, for example, has a water sharing treaty with Pakistan, which is not exactly a friendly neighbor of India. But that water sharing treaty is the world's most generous water sharing arrangement under which India has left more than 80% of all the waters of the Indus river system. There are six rivers in the Indus river system. More than 80% of the waters have been left for Pakistan's exclusive use. No treaty in the world comes anywhere close to this level of generosity. Yet that treaty has failed to make the relationship between the two countries better. The reason is that the water treaty is compartmentalized. It's not part and parcel of a larger political and security framework. I think uh, Arish uh, was right to introduce the caveat on meat. But I would uh, urge him to look at the bigger picture. The human population today totals about 7.8 billion globally. But the livestock population on our planet now, numbers between 150 billion to 200 billion. Now, this is the most conservative estimate. To, you know, to provide food to 7.8 billion people, we are rearing between 150 to 200 billion livestock at any given time. So the direct ecological footprint of the livestock population on our planet is much larger than that of the human population. And the fast rising global meat consumption has become a key driver of water stress and environmental degradation. So I would urge everyone to look at the bigger picture. What we eat is a personal choice, but the bigger picture should not be lost. The question was about water joining gold and oil as a traded commodity. Not a surprise to me. After all, the era of cheap, bountiful water has been replaced by increasing supply and quality constraints. Many international investors in recent years have been looking at water as the new oil. If you look at the bottle water industry, there was no bottle water industry worth the name when I was a student. 
The bottled water industry has risen only in the last 20 years or so. And the dramatic rise of the bottled water industry attests to the increasing commodification of the world's most critical resource, water. And also consider one sobering fact. I don't know how many, how many of you even realize this. Today, the retail price of bottled mineral water, not just in Germany, even in India or Africa or anywhere in the world, the retail price of bottled mineral water today is higher than the international spot price of crude oil. Yesterday, this, the, yesterday Brent crude closed at, at about 150, sorry, at $50 a barrel, at $50 a barrel. One barrel is 159 liters. 159 liters make one barrel. So 50, 50 US dollars would be about 45 euros. And you buy 159 liters of bottled mineral water at any supermarket in Germany for that price for, for, 50, uh, for 45 euros, you cannot, right? So it's, it, you know, it shows how quickly the water situation has changed to the extent that crude oil sells cheaper than an equivalent quantity of bottled mineral water. So water is not just heavier than oil, but bottled water is also dearer than oil. Against this background, is it any surprise that some international investors are looking at water as a new oil? The water-related risks come with business opportunities. Risk is a major driver of innovation. Let's hope that investors make far-sighted decisions and that these decisions turn the water crisis into an engine of innovation and profit and helps us to solve the water problems that the world faces. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Before I give uh, the final word to Ulrich Lee, uh, let me just say, I, I really do hope and I'm, I'm almost certain that our students got a lot out of uh, this discussion. Um, uh, I, I would like to encourage all students to finish their papers and if they have uh, questions, uh, please contact uh, Araj and myself uh, so that we can work on them together. Um, I can remember very well in 1978, I was in, in Bonn in a seminar chaired by Professor Hans Adolf Jakobsen. It was on uh, foreign policy and the conference on security uh, uh, and uh, on the CSCE uh, in, in, in Europe. And uh, well, uh, Professor Jakobsen brought Otto von der Gablenz uh, into the seminar. Otto von der Gablenz was Helmut Schmitz, who at that time was the chancellor, main foreign affairs advisor. And this seminar is one of those that, that are until today deep in my mind. So it is, in my point of view, very important that we as academics bring politicians, bring people from the practical life, from, from enterprises, from all parts of the society into our seminars, that we are not in an ivory tower, but that we understand how the real world uh, exists and that we try to well, influence that world. And therefore we ask at CASAS our students for at the end policy recommendations. They have their, do their analysis and then we ask for a few recommendations because we want to educate them to really become people who influence things and not only uh, debate them and analyze them. And in that sense and in that spirit, uh, CASAS was founded. And uh, one who stands for that is uh, Professor Schlie, and uh, Ulrich, the, the floor is yours. Deepak, many thanks. Um, also, um, I'll try to be brief, as you promised a punkt landung. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on a fascinating seminar. Um, I would also like to congratulate all of us that we have lured you to Bonn and I do hope that it's not the last time that you brought in uh, uh, such um, an expertise in, in your seminar. I 
would like to thank Professor Brahma Jelani and Member of Parliament Jürgen Trittin for their expertise and their valuable contributions. And I do hope that we see in a not too distant future um, ourselves again in Bonn and then in person, uh, perhaps at the occasion of our annual forum in fall uh, next year. I also would like uh, to encourage all the students to concentrate uh, on that topic. The relevance is pretty clear um, and you should look deeper into it. Um, you should develop your own research proposals. And I can assure you, um, especially in the combination with the question of global governance of water, which has been mentioned in, in the seminar and uh, the United Nations systems and the German foreign policy aspects. Uh, this is a rewarding topic. Again, many thanks for joining, uh, for um, contributing. And again, Friedbert, many thanks for bringing together such um, an eminent round um, and for being with us. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you to all of you. Uh, stay healthy and a Merry Christmas. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Friedman, everyone. Happy New Year.